Hey everybody, welcome to Nomads Nation episode 7. Um, today we're doing a pretty cool episode, something a bit different, where we're going to be interviewing the two lead designers at Bellroy. Sorry if I had butchered your guys' job descriptions, but we'll get into that in a second. And I just want this to be a free flow conversation where we can learn more about the Bellroy process because this community is just you know, the Nomad Nation community is crazy about your guys' brand, and, and same thing with Bo, and we just kind of want to jump in. So I'm going to be taking lead, but Bo is going to interject anytime he's intrigued or has any other questions. And yeah, we just kind of want to jump in and do a little background first. So we're going to do some rapid fire questions. But first, Bo, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. I have a little bit of a cough and a stuffy nose. So if my voice sounds a little bit weirder than the other times, I'm sorry about that. Appreciate the disclaimer, Bo. Thanks for that. <laughs> Honestly, uh, first. And then, uh, David, how you doing today, bud? Welcome to the Nomad Nation podcast. Thanks, mate. It's really Honestly good to first, be here. Of course, that's our, that's our policy here. Yeah, it's um, it's good to be here. I'm I'm overwhelmed by Bo's visual experience behind him. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> and uh, JJ, yourself, how you doing today? Yeah, doing good. Doing good. It's just you know, day at work, making sure that we uh, keep trying to make rad stuff. And I look very forward to talking more about that rad stuff. But first, I like um, to give the audience some like background of the people that we're interviewing. But I don't like the, the boring like tell me your three minute story and where you were born and all that. So we're just gonna do like some rapid fire stuff, okay? And I'm gonna go back and forth between you guys. Um, JJ, I'm gonna start with you. What's your official job at Bellroy? Uh, product director, and I focus on the bags and then also the tech product. Okay, and that was kind of my second question of what that means. So you're a product director, and that's it, it, it's bags and what? Tech. So, bags and tech. So yeah, pretty much it's working with. Um, we've got a team here, and we all kind of collaborate and work together on like the broader product set. But then, like within that, I've got like more of a focus within you know the bags, uh, soft goods, and then also the tech. So iPhone, uh, phone cases, and our other kind of like more molded product. Got it. Got it. All right. Next question is what ultimate, uh, what, what, what like made you get into this field? What got you into soft goods design? Uh, I did industrial design at university and didn't like, I thought I wanted to be a CAD jockey cause I loved working in 3d uh, graphics so much. And then um, I don't know what happened. Somehow I ended up uh, working for a bag company um, whilst I was still in university. And then after that I went into footwear um, and then it just kind of flowed on from there. And I think the big turning point was um, like I spent some time living in Vietnam, moved over there to work with Crumpler for a few years. And I was in hook, line and sinker and it's been oh, that way cool. since. So it's close to 20 years now of uh, designing and uh, working with bags. That's amazing. That, that's brilliant. What's your uh, favorite Bellroy product and why? It, it hasn't been released yet. Ah, well, tell us all about it. We're ready, please. <laughs> it's a it's a special edition and um, a little bit of a classic reissue that's currently my favorite. But that changes. You ask me in another month, and it'll be something else that that I'm actively working on. I could imagine that's a pretty accurate answer. And finally, JJ, before we move over to Davin, um, what's another carry brand that you really respect that's not Bellroy? And that's almost like if you had to work at a different brand that wasn't Bellroy, which one are you like? Damn, they're doing some pretty cool stuff. I had to work. Um, that's a very different thing. I think that I really like DB Journey for a lot of elements within them. Um, I think there's a lot that's working with Peak, and I really enjoy the guys from Evergoods as well. So there's a few there, but to work, that's that's a difficult one. Different question. All right, we'll just leave it for admiration yeah. for right now. All right, Davin, coming over to you. Official job at Bellroy. Yeah, so I'm a design director like JJ. Um, and I guess as he kind of described, he covers a certain area. I'm set up to kind of cover the other areas so that we've got full coverage across the teams. Um, my area is the small leather goods. So I work a lot on all of the, the leather, the small wallets, um, that place. We have a bit of a crossover probably in um, accessories and pouches and that space. But the other part of my job that's a big probably big predominant role is the CMF. So I head up all the color material and finish for um, Bellroy. And so breaking that down from its mystical um, description is pretty much all the textiles, the way color comes to life um, through our leather on the tech, on the bags, um, textile design, all of that um, being brought to life. Brilliant. And Davin, you know, same question to you. What ultimately made you get into this field? 
Um, I was just passionate about design. I've got a background like JJ, industrial designer as well. Um, I moved um, into a brand called Boroy, uh, sorry, into Rip Curl, a, a, surf, um, a surf brand many, many years ago, um, which was close proximity to to where Bellroy started up. And I moved to Rip Curl when the Bellroy um, co-founders were just had left Bellroy, sorry, Rip Curl to start Bellroy. Um, I actually sort of filled some of their positions and worked at um, Rip Curl for a number of years. And then I got headhunted to come across to um, Bellroy when they were starting to grow and they knew they had something happening. So um, I think worked on lots of different products and lots of different background, but I think mine was probably more about um, roles and, and journey. Um, I was drawn to it because my my grandfather was a farrier, so he worked in leather as well. And so I was kind of really drawn when I was working at Rib Curl on the leather wallets and then the Bellroy brand sort of, yeah, connected with me. Brilliant. And then on that note with, you know, Bellroy wallets, it, it may be a wallet, it might not be, but what's your favorite Bellroy product and why? Uh, it's probably our, one of our market totes. The things I love are the things that usually aren't sold to the world. They're things that I've hacked or have, um, I guess, special editions of. So it's probably a, an all leather market tote that's been, um, brought to, brought to life like our market tote, but in a full leather build that's like suede, which I love. I use every day. Brilliant. And then... Any other brands out there, whether it's that you just admire, that you would work for, carry brands that you know you just think are pretty awesome, you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, I think JJ touched on DB Journey. I love what they do from just a design coherent perspective. Um, probably one that springs to mind, I love out of Chicago, um, 1733. Um, I love just the culture and the character and the charisma and the nostalgia that's brought to life in great utility. Um, I think he and his team are doing some great stuff that just puts a smile on my dial every time I see a launch or something new coming from their studio. That's a really good call. That's a really good call. Yeah. For sure. Interesting. I, 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 Bo, have you, uh, have you reviewed anything from 1773? No, I have not. I've, are you familiar uh, with the brand? No, I need to Google that. I'm just smiling because um, I had just a vivid memory that when I was a kid and my parents took me to Bali all of the time, I always wanted t-shirts from Rip Curl. So <laughs> I'm, all, I'm smiling that you've been working at Rip Curl. I was all about these Rip Curl shirts. You know, when you are 16, you always want to buy the t-shirts with all of the prints and it was always Rip Curl. I wanted Rip Curl all the way. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of that company back then. But I didn't surf, so I was just wearing the stuff. No, but that was that was the allure in the '90s of you know um, surf brands were almost like luxury that was sought after. You know, um, yeah. No, we've all been in totally. that. We've all been in that space. We're all aspirational surfers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same. But Bo, I didn't want to leave you out of the questionnaire. Uh, what's your favorite Bellroy product that you ever reviewed or tested, Bo? If you had to pick one, I know you've had a lot. The Apex. I really like the Apex. The Apex uh, backpack? Yeah, that's a great backpack, definitely. And I just recently found uh, a use for the Bellroy pencil case. I was, I got the pencil case and I was never sure how to utilize it because I was like, I don't care pencils. I don't care carry uh, pens because I do everything on the computer or on the phone. And now I realized mm -hmm. it's the perfect med kit for me. It's great for band-aids, ibuprofen, and stuff like that. Exactly, that one. And I put everything that I need. It's, it's basically my, my boo-boo pouch. So Your boo-boo pouch. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's adorable, Bo. <laughs> that's my boo-boo pouch. <laughs> if I fall down on the ground and I'm crying <laughs> with my knee in my hand, I have my boo-boo pouch in a better pencil case. <laughs> so it's so that versatile. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. You guys, should, yeah, you guys should change the, the, the name, all right? It should be the boo-boo, yeah. the, the Bellroy boo-boo case. You're, you're going to be yeah. flying off the shelves. Pitch that to your marketing team. They'll love it. <laughs> yeah, we might have to run it past legal. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I wanted to give a shout out to my favorite Bellroy product real fast because there's a lot like there really are. I've been playing around with the Folio recently. I've just been loving this thing. But um, this uh, who, who do I have to thank for the Bellroy Venture oh, yeah. Ready Sling 2.5 liter? JJ, is that is that your team? Yeah, that's on their team, and um, 
there's a few of us who worked on it, but that was really with uh, Aaron and Tara, who, like, Aaron's one of our, our designers. He's the guy who's come out from Utah, and then Tara is a, a lead pattern maker, and, um, yeah, she hails from Arc'teryx background. Please so. send them Bo and I's regards, because we're, we're oh, really big be. fans of that sling. No, shout out to the person who made the uh, hip pack. That is oh, my that's right. Favorite. You like the hip pack. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. A ba- my favorite bag. And I'm honestly looking for a replacement or I'm looking for a competitor in this smallish 1.5 literish space. You're basically unique. I, I, I wasn't able to find a single alternative to that bag. That bag is amazing. So we've got a belt bag coming in the Light family in like a couple of weeks. So I think it's really worth having a look at that because it's taking some of that essence, but it's like stripped out and kind of like pulled it into the light um, kind oh, of like economy with fabrics where it's like we don't add extra layers. We keep everything really paired back and that one's feeling really strong. And I don't, mm. don't know if you want to touch on the textiles dab, but there's a little big overhaul there too. I, yeah, I would love to. Let's um, let's take this one step at a time though because I want to really – yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover easy. here, guys. Um, easy so I really easy want to, Thanks for whoa, participating whoa. in my, my rapid fire. I think, we're, yeah, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we're all warmed up. So I guess that, you know, what I want to do here is get a – I just want an idea, like, of you guys to paint the picture of what it looks like from an idea in one of your heads to having a product being sold on your website or in retail. Like, I – I know it's, a, it's probably a long process that it could, it could take days to explain, but I'm looking for kind of just, you know, paint the overview and, you know, however you guys want to take it. But I just want to kind of get a deeper understanding of what that Bellroy process looks like. And I'll leave it to either of you guys to sort of take lead on that. But, yeah, blow my mind. I'm, I'm freaking ready. Do you want to jump in with the leather goods, Dad? Because sure. it's a different process. Uh, all yeah. right, all right, uh, I'll take it. Well, do um, we'll that. It depends that, on what we're really doing. So... When we kind of kick off a project, there's like a couple of different ways that we go about it. Like sometimes it's an idea, other times it's much more mathematical. (laughs) We kind of like have a voting and scoring system about like what, what do we want to pursue or what, what overarching theme do we actually have for the brand that we want to start to work towards. And then we look at our families now that we've got things quite established and actually just start to tease out where we want to to build and to grow and so for a new family this is like a really big undertaking and requires a lot of uh sampling and trial and error jj i got got a quick question so when you say the word family are you you referring to like like a series like like the venture series or the the light series okay just making sure and so if you're making uh something with invention now that we've done the hard work it's actually a lot easier for us because we have so many starting uh rules established but for a new family it's actually like a big collaborative effort that involves you know working on the key shape working really heavily with uh dav and the uh, cmf team on like what materials are actually going to be combining to kind of bring it to life and then i don't know what actually happens but Someone starts making something at some point. And so that can be uh, pieces of paper that are pulled together. I'm a huge fan of staples. And I, I like, instead of sewing, we'll just staple things together and we'll hack existing bags that we've got. We'll start pulling together paper mock-ups and, and then start building them into loose fabric versions and start sewing and making them. Sometimes it can just be, you know, with drawings, but all of the time, it just kind of has a little genesis point and that that's the thing that, that is a little tricky that's to pin so down cool. that's cool that's really cool and i'm curious too like on that note that's also interesting all right i want to know like even taking a step back though new product is that coming from the design team or is it coming from like the top like ceos like hey guys we need more slings or you know like h- how much freedom does the departments have and davin i want to hear your guys as, as well like do you have a lot of freedom as to where you're just making products at will uh, via your department? Is there some collaboration with the more executive, for lack of a better word, um, branch in Bellroy? Or yeah, paint that picture for me, Davin. I'd love to hear actually your perspective on that. Yeah, I think in response to that, it's probably C, all of the above. Um, But I think we are very much a product and design led business. And we have been from from the very beginning. So there are times when we know a thing is working really well, and we might say we want to expand on a range and we 
definitely want to do more of what's working well, and that might come from a product management team. Um, there are times when also, you know, JJ touched on a feedback loop, right? Like we like to think of ourselves as global citizens, like we're sold all over the world. It's probably easier to mention the three or four countries we're not sold in than the other way around. And there's times where we really are relying on our wholesale or our sales team or um, people that are on the ground or have got connections with retailers or we're seeing things happen in cities that might inform the design team who can't be everywhere all at once when we're designing, you know, slings or products that we want to work really well in parts of Asia or Japan or in Europe. And we see different things going on in different worlds. And I think that's probably even more polarizing in wallet behavior than it is um, from maybe a broader carry sense. I think we all probably carry there's trends and cultural differences that we see going on in the carry. But I think where maybe, you know, slings or crossbodies aren't adapted or backpacks are or messengers are a thing in a certain country. But I think we certainly see a more polarizing um, regional things going on. Germany is a great example, right, where we've seen all sorts of different currency behavior. Um, we saw challenges for years where we had an old, very large size of the Bible um, passport. I'm joking, not that big. But a, a, a generation of um, German um, passports that were big and chunky, right? And that throws a spanner into, you know, passport fits and wallets design. You know, we, we, you know, JJ and I, we talk about it. It's like we sweat the details. And I think in my department and JJ has been in that for a long time too. It's like those micro millimeters and particularly in tech all matter. So when we've got um, currency behaviors going on in Germany, where we're seeing from those feedback loops where um, cash or coin is still really heavily used, um, that that can really change and inform um, what's going on from a design studio where we're very isolated at times, even though we're out seeing what's going on, we'd have really different inputs that would affect process and product outcomes, as well as, I guess I've touched on, you know, feature outcomes um, that can be radically different. That sparked so many questions already that uh, I, I, I... Me have. too, but I want you to go first, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to hold myself back, but I'm like, Bo needs to ask a question. Or take take the mic, Bo. Sure. I have uh, that sparked so many questions, and I'm not sure which one to ask first. I'm kind of giddy about which to an, uh, ask first, but I'm just going to segue to something that you just said, because um, I would love to know how do you al actually balance those international differences when you design a product because i feel especially with as you said u.s and european bills or passports or more importantly which is more current with uh plugs we germans we have totally different plugs than u.s plugs and i feel like every time i see I watched. Uh, I went to your product page yesterday just to look a little bit around, and I saw so many of those videos where you have the Mac charger of your MacBook with the US plugs that you can just fold inwards. So it's really easy to store that away. But then you have us stupid Germans with those plugs that are hanging off the sides and make everything so difficult. How do you? Yeah, how do you design for so many different needs? And I feel like the UK plug is even more difficult, right? With the three yeah. prongs. So how do you design for that? Who wants well, to we take have, it? We <laughs> have all it. of those plugs here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things. It's like we've got a collection of all of those different global plugs. We've got like mock-ups of all the different size bills and size <clears throat> notes from a global kind of point of view. Yeah. Um, so often we're actually, um, looking at like local areas and like some of those challenges that they've got to deal with and just making sure that we have those items on hand so that we can actually experience what it is. So in particular, like the UK plug is an absolute beast yes. and it breaks many models of tech kit ideas and, and other slim products that you really want to come out with because mm. that, that thing is what, like five and a half centimeters across. It's, it's massive. Yeah. Um, but it's just having all of those tools on hand and that, that balancing act of like how you prioritize what element to work with or which one to focus on, that's kind of part of the magic. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't think that there's like a real easy answer other than just yeah. exposing yourself to it and trying. 
it's uh, it's so much because I feel like you can you you as a designer you can't really win right because on one hand you obviously kind of look at your main demographics which I assume is probably USA or your main target group and then you kind of I'm not sure if that's the right word alienate maybe some of the other parts of the world because oh that German passport won't fit in that Belroy travel wallet but hey we kind of need to take a look at I mean now all passports are the same but I vividly remember when my passport was triple the size of the American (laughs) passport (laughs) at JFK the the people are like what the hell is this book (laughs) yeah so I I think it's it's really tough for you guys to design for the world yeah and i think the way we do that i mean it's it's like apparel and in bags we have it it's the fit challenge you know of different sizes of humans and getting ergonomics right and you guys have explored this you know before and and you get around that with multiple sizes we if i jump back to a wallet example again it's um i mean that's a really easy tangible one to answer which is like the US has what we would call the lower uh, currency notes of the world. And so if you look at our hide and seek, we offer two sizes in it. There's a tall and there's a low and we don't ever offer the high. It's probably more a European or parts of Asia. But once again, like JJ said, we've got a lot of currency or mocks of the things that exist in the world. Um, and we're making sure that we're designing products that are great for those in the regions that you're in. We're lucky to be sophisticated enough yeah. to be able to have both of those options, um, and the and the and the network through wholesale yeah, and direct to consumer. But touching on some of that other stuff too, it's like, you know, we've got translators and websites that are dedicated for certain regions of the world that are big enough to quantify that. Um, and our photography does our photography team does an incredible job of making sure that those products when they're photographed as well as the product design t- design team, making sure that those products work really well. It's probably flexibility, right, JJ? It's another thing, or the ability to adapt um, for multiple use case scenarios, because some of us carry more, some of us carry less. Um, but our photography team does a great job also of showcasing currency. Mm-hmm. So if you're in certain regions, you can jump in and see your bills or your coins or your notes, or hopefully, you know, your charges or, or certain things down to that level. Yeah, and I think that that comment about alienating some people globally when you make some choices is definitely something that, um, like, I, I think Australians have a, a relatively unique position globally in that, like, we've got a lot of contact in through Asia very easily. Um, a lot of our team is international. We have a lot of travelers within us. So we have this kind of, like, global experience and this like yeah. want to do product that doesn't feel like it's of one any of any particular region like i don't think that we show up as being a uniquely australian brand we are definitely incredibly uh focused on being australian but we try to make that product as wide reaching and as applicable across the world as possible And I think that as we've been able to grow and scale a bit more, we've got more opportunity to do that. And we're now starting to do more products in multiple sizes so that there's better options for finding the fit that works for you, whether that's based on like your your physical nature or whether that's based on actually your carry style as well. That makes sense, and it all it's all kind of tied in together. But um, I'm kind of curious, just to kind of close the loop on the process. Um, so JJ, as you were saying, idea whether it comes from you know whatever department, and then you guys are cutting paper, you're stapling, you're sewing, and boom, you got a. I, what, what would you guys call it when you have a working? Well, actually, let me even take it a step further back. Then, like, do you make your quote unquote like golden samples at your development facility at Bellroy, or is that something that the factory handles? Where, where does that relationship work with like where you guys pass the torch to the factories to finish a product? So there's a, there's a huge chasm between that start and that golden sample. And so we use a point system within Bellroy where as you develop a product, you start at zero and then your aim is to get to one, which is that, uh, that golden sample stage. And within those points, we actually have different check-in stages. So that initial kind of concept is at point three. 
and that is when we take our ideas and it, this can be loose it can be a homebrew sample it can be two different bags stapled together and just showing a, an idea mm -hmm. and we do an internal review and presentation that's actually focused around making sure that we have different areas of the business that all get a seat at the table and kind of get to to look at what the intention is and have a moment to actually review and comment and feedback on that at a really early stage and we use that to then progress to the next stage which is 0.6 and we do that same process again with the same people but everyone's kind of been along for the journey and then we do it again and then again <laughs> and then then that's when we kind of like hand over to that product development i gotta ask so i just want to paint this picture because that that process sounds fucking awesome because like it seems like it's so inclusive to the whole company it's not just like you're isolating the design team uh hey guys this is us and you know when we're ready we'll show you you know it seems like you're bringing everybody along for the rides so that the marketing team the sales team the customer support team everybody sort of has a say in the process is, is, is that a pretty accurate description of that yeah and it it's we've come to this method through seeing the challenges of getting a project too far along without having key stakeholders in that next phase for the business being aware of it or being able to contribute information that that might have been th synthesized by the design team mm. or it may be you know sp regionally specific that it's like hey we've noticed this but say that the problem was only something that was existing for a very small part of uh of the brand as a whole and say like you know a u.s wholesale team then have a chance to chime in and say oh we found the opposite is true in our market mm. and so it gives us the chance to at the same time as we're developing a project to actually course correct and steer the project towards a different destination. So our starting point and our initial genesis shouldn't be definition of what the outcome is. It's more like this is where we're beginning. And then as we take it through this process, we get the chance to like adjust course, correct, get more information, get more buy-in and actually just get, people better aware of what we're coming out with so that they're almost like bought into the concept as well. And then everyone ends up getting, you know, closer to what, what is going to work for, for all of us. Sorry, I was going to say the thing we use and make sure we talk about early on is that the sample that we talk about, whatever it is in that early stage, we talk about it as a North star. Um, and it's really important that that North star is, it's sort of, its job is to build the stoke and it's a beacon early on. But what the thing we don't want it to be, which is what JJ's described, is a GPS because it's, it still needs to hold vibe and hope and, and be able to shift and change along that journey. Um, so it's still, it's a thing you're drawn to. It's a thing that's still strong along that process, but it's not locked in. It's not definite. It's dynamic as it moves through. No, that's great. I mean, it allows you guys to, you know, be like water, right? To adapt as it needs to adapt, you know, with a different feedback from the team, you know, and to make sure everybody's involved in the entire process. And then it gets to a point, I assume, where you sort of pass it on to the factory, right? And I'm curious because you guys are, you know, one of the bigger carry brands that like Bo and I have reviewed, I'd say, you know, there's obviously the bigger ones, the Patagonias and whatnot, but your factory setup is quite interesting where I'll look at one product and it says made in Philippines, the other's made in India. I think you have some made in China as well. Davin, I'm curious why um, this sort of like international factory setup as opposed to just, you know, just being in one country, which I would imagine would have logistical benefits as well. Um, what, what, why, why the uh, the disbursement? And actually, is my analysis correct that you are doing different factories around the world? Yeah, that's that's right. And I think I think probably that geography is a response to probably working out who we wanted to work with that would meet with our beliefs with product, which is to make great product. Um, so for instance, uh, our bags are spot on. I think some of those have got some different locations now, but we've got parts in Asia and Philippines being one of those. But I can talk to the India one um, where we produce all of our wallets. And that's because we're yet to find anyone else in the world that's as skilled and has the knowledge and the techniques to make the best products in the world. It's like, um, and so that's that's the driver there where we've got relationships and, and we've been with some of those makers since the you know, Bell Rose started. Um, some of us have worked with them even, you know, five or 10 years before that um, at previous businesses. Um, and so I think a lot of the time it's expertise that probably drives that, that primary decision there. Um, I think that's 
that we've got multiple locations. And I think you'll probably find across those categories, it's the expertise in those locations that separates them rather than us hunting, maybe like some apparel brands where we're chasing price or labor costs are cheaper here, or um, it's probably more that we're able to produce the products to the level and the standard um, that we want to achieve. May I interject a question while we are still in this, let's say, design discussion phase of the team? Is that okay, Aaron, or do we have... have Two thumbs up, dude. Keep it Uh, rolling. Because (laughs) I I would be interested. I I feel that from my perspective and from what I've seen in the community, Bellroy is in a very unique position in, in this in this bag world in terms of on one hand you are very highly respected by all of the bag enthusiast world and on the other hand you're already with i'm not sure if that's the right description with one foot in the mainstream world where in air quotes regular people know of bellroy they they perceive you as a very high quality brand and as a brand that is of course i can give my dad a wallet from Bellroy or hey I'm I'm going to work I'm not going to buy the I don't know Samsonite or Jansport backpack but I'd rather get a Bellroy backpack so you are in both worlds in terms of the diehard enthusiasts who really want the highest quality but also with one foot in the world of mainstream people that have no I would say not really that much interest in being high quality but they they just want a bag that works right that looks good and i would like to know being in that very cool position in both worlds how do you balance those expectations of the bag enthusiast world or the pros with desire to attract more mainstream target demographics or mainstream people because I would assume it's very difficult to kind of justify to in air quotes mainstream people oh this is the I exaggerate a little bit two thousand dollar X pack backpack that is durable to with withstand war or whatever or has the fit locks 2100 that are very expensive you know what i mean so how do you balance those two expectations of those very diff uh different target demographics um i think it's uh like i'll talk quickly on like from the the bag kind of point of view because i think that like at our core we started with carryology which actually preceded bellroy Mm-hmm. And the founders of Bellroy are uh, through and through bag geeks. And so that's kind of what attracted um, myself into the brand as being like from a, a very bag geek bra- background. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really interesting to see in the, the product design ethos, there's a lot of sweat that is going into all of the small details and all of the refinements. As Dav was pointing out before of like these like point two of a millimeter sky being that goes on a small section of leather so that we get the right fold over. Yeah. Um, this kind of like attention to quality and detail, I think people perceive even when they're not in like the geek level for the product. That's true. So I think that it's like that quality that gets imbued into all the different components that we choose into the effort that we have in selecting materials into the effort that we do for doing patterns and the effort that we do for doing styles that that our goal is to make sure that they're going to last and not go out of fashion and be too on trend. I think everyone can kind of uh, see that. And I think that that's what's actually given us that ability to kind of like talk to, talk to the hardcore, talk to the cariologist, mm. talk to someone who's really deep in the field, but then also be appealing to someone who's looking for a step up you know, that they, they are like have identified that their Jansport bag is like a little low featured and they want something that's like that dresses up a little bit better, mm-hmm. that lets them take it into work and wear it a little bit uh, prouder. And it's like we kind of like, I think, fit in that space and give people, yeah. um, you know, that opportunity just to, to kind of have that step up moment. Mm. That's cool. Because I've, I feel like 
I'm not sure how it's in different parts of the world, but especially in Germany, it's still this perception of, oh, it's, in air quotes, just a bag. Why the hell should I spend that much? And I feel that just that thought alone makes it so difficult for, I would say, a brand to design something that is durable and cool and long-lasting and feature-packed while still having a price that is attractive to that kind of person that is not yet believing that he or she wants a good quality bag because I, in Germany at least it's still this I don't need a good backpack or I don't need a good bag and I'm always arguing yeah but there is this 2000 euro MacBook Pro inside your backpack do you really want to carry it in a tote that you got from from the supermarket i'm not sure if that's the right you know it's it's this perception yeah, of bag and this um yeah wanting to have something that is good quality is still not there yet i feel at least in germany and yeah that's what i thought it makes it difficult for you as designers being in both places in the mainstream and in the enthusiast world to find the balance i think that is very difficult and i'm i think i believe that you hit the nail on the head you really figured out how to do both parts of those target demographics yeah i think there's attention to detail would be the thing that i'd call out i'm not sure what your perception on a dav how you think that we managed to stride in both yeah thank you so much for answering all those questions jj because it's to me at least it's so interesting um and i have yeah well, of, i feel like questions. i'm going shallow on the answers as well no, because there's like so much uh so much more depth because like we talk about this stuff all day and have done for years so yeah. it's kind of like it's almost uh it's good to have an opportunity just to kind of share a bit it's, Dude, it's really I mean, we're, I, I, I have so like, everything you say. I'm like, oh my god, I have 17 more questions about yeah, what that. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, you're, you're you're doing really good with the answers because you're intriguing me. Obviously, we're limited on time, but hey, you know, if this goes well, we can you know do a deep dive into a couple of things more specifically because you know I'm, I certainly I certainly am interested in knowing the answers to some more stuff. But um, do the best that we can with the time that we have. Yeah, I think one of the, the big insights that we've got and we're getting ready to figure out a way to kind of share it outside of the Bellroy team is really that point system. Like we've uncovered a way to progress product um, quicker that's more team involved, that has chances for feedback loops, that gets mm -hmm. a higher quality consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all just based around actually breaking that project apart into those segmented stages. Um, yeah. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see if we did want to try and actually share that out wider, how we would actually approach approach doing that. How long has that system been in play for now, JJ? Like the, the point system that you're referring to? Six years. Okay. I think we've refined it now. After, after COVID, we really took it into stride and that's when it really came to to show us what a powerful tool we had i mean it sounds like a fantastic way to keep everything organized keep projects you know moving because obviously projects are so multifaceted there's so many moving pieces so you just have the point system it kind of keeps everybody on the same trajectory i can see why it's working yeah. out well for you guys and then does every single like designer they have like their own things that they're working on so you could, ha you could have different projects that are in different parts of the point system right yeah, well, you can run concurrent projects all at different stages. So you can have different point check-ins for different projects happen one week after another, but everyone understands where that project is at relative to the other project. So mm -hmm. it gets nice for overlaying. For sure. Um, yeah, for how we split work up, we basically end up with like a lead designer per project and that person will be like the, the champion for that particular style. And then we plug in all the other people um, who are needed around it to support. So, you know, there won't be just one designer working in isolation. It really is like a, a team effort and a group of people all, all jumping on when needed, as needed. How long will it typically take, just because you're, you're in the bag department, for, let's say, a regular backpack, not, 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 a, not a sling, let's say a backpack, to go from idea to market? uh record time would be about nine months that's record. Um, okay so that, that was a, yeah that was that was lightning fast 
So nine months is pretty good, pretty good time from we're talking from the genesis through to to actual release. For sure. um, but that's but that's when I think you've got a few things working in your favor. So that'll normally be for a product that's in an existing family and, and you know, we know generally what we want. All right, guys, sorry about that. We had a couple of technical difficulties. I think we lost Davin. We were having some Wi-Fi problems. We're going to get Davin back on the show later, but we're going to continue the conversation with Bo, myself, and JJ. Bo, we were talking to JJ about some backpack stuff. Um, where do you want to take it from here? Yeah, while we're still are talking about this design stage that you are in and you are all discussing, I imagine, like a big round table candles and everything that you are that really epic. deep deep into and epic music in the background and designing stuff and i was one i was always wondering and this is maybe a little bit of my personal in the air quotes issues um when i see a bag with an organizational admin panel or a tech pouch for instance you have so many cool tech pouches how do you kind of design for those admin and organizational slots in regard to what items you anticipate being loaded in them? Do you have like a specific set in your design stage where you say, okay, we design an admin panel and it has to have a pen slot, it has to have a slot for a MacBook Pro charger and mouse, or do you, or is it just like, okay, we need to have at least four slots and four compartments that are drop-in slots. How do you design for that? And do you, or do you anticipate a specific set of items being loaded in these kind of admin panels or tech pouches? Is that... Lo love this question, yeah. Bo. So we are all users of tech. You know, so there's no one in the in the design team or in in Bellroy who isn't isn't using a laptop, who isn't hot desking. Uh, we have our offices, you know, like a two hour kind of like uh, trip apart, and we make those journeys ourselves. So yeah. that actually gives us a really good grounding in what is it that we use, what is it from a functionality point of view that that we've enjoyed using and then where do we see those gaps or those those issues with some of the setups that we've got mm -hmm. so i think in our earlier products we were much more prescriptive and then now we try to be a little bit more open world in how you can pack and try not to be so focused on making it that you have to use the product in a certain way um it's a big update that i think you did a review of the ready pack and of that top admin pocket mm -hmm. exactly. and that simple moment of just having that center division, which has you have like a left zone and a right zone. And the whole point is that you can have a big area and that simple cut up means that you can like pocket dump straight yeah. into there and you're accidentally organized. Like you didn't have yeah. to accidentally think about organized. actually like <laughs> putting things in. You just kind of like go into the natural home. And that's the yeah. same with uh, like pop pockets in Tokyo Tote. You know, they're just like these these zones that, that just become easy for you to just reach out and fill. And we've really tried to avoid that you have to, um, you know, get your pens just in the right zone and you can only have like a certain size notebook and you can only have certain size glasses. We just try to tr keep everything just a bit more approachable and easy. Yeah. One of the best examples of this, like one of my favorites is the uh, Tokyo Wonder Tote. And the front of this is like two large pockets and yeah. it's just one zip to get into this double breasted pocket zone. And the thing that gets so, so good about it is you start to learn instinctively what side you put what product on. So it's like, I always have my MacBook charger on the right hand side mm. because when I've opened the zip, it's the secondary thing. If I've got my phone in there, it's always on the left one. So the moment that I open the zip, it's the first one to reach into and you just start getting familiar with the bag and yeah. and like with interacting with it and we try to make it that yeah you don't have to think like it's a very much um about just like that intuitive way of actually just just working and operating yeah. with it i feel that i really like organization and being able to to store stuff in a specific place but i usually run into 
admin panels or bags where <coughs> I have always the saying that I don't want a bag to make me change my packing style. The best yeah. example is a pen. For instance, I use these rubberized pens. They never fit any pen <laughs> slot. And I can see from, from a design standpoint that you want to have a lot of slots and a lot of, or not, not you want, but I can see many people utilizing those slots. But on the other hand, it makes it very difficult also to kind of find the specific yeah. item to slot into those things or for instance magic mouse from apple really easy to slot in but a logitech mouse no way you're gonna fit it but this is obviously a very specific case and therefore i was always wondering when you sit at the table and design this kind of stuff do you how do you design the 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 circumference of the the elastics that you put into your tech pouch do you design it okay yeah, it should and- fit and on that, Bo, just like just like to add to that with JJ, JJ, my my question is sort of out on top. But like, do you guys do like market research? Like, hey, seventy one percent of our users use Magic Mouse as opposed to you know, or or is it much more organic in that sense, where you just kind of you know try and find slots that are less prescriptive or, or pockets that are less prescriptive? Yeah, yeah I think um, we have a very di- diverse team, so we're able to look around us and and observe what different people are using and what products we actually have chosen for ourselves to work with with tech um we are very apple focused so that does tend to bias sure. things but i don't think that the magic mouse is um really you know something that that is difficult to fit i think it once you start getting more to your logitech like you know quite quite tall pieces like i can see that there's a bit of a challenge with actually seeing where that would be appropriate but that's why we put like a general purpose pocket in mm. and often these will be elastic and you will notice that they show up in certain bags, but not so much in other bags. And so if you look at it from our product family point of view, such as like a venture range, mm. these ones have tech optimization, but they're not totally tech focused and they're very tech agnostic. They're not saying like, this is just for your, your Mac, and your iPad and your your magic mouse that slips into any pocket or just an external trackpad. Yeah. We tend to have like a softer volume pocket that will have an elastic entry. They can fit like a wide variety of whatever you need. But then when we move over into like a Tokyo family product, you know, this might be more Mac centric and we might, won't be necessarily looking for someone who's got peripherals that are a bit more challenging. You know, that is not a product where we're putting in a special little tie like an adventure product that helps you hold a, um, a camera tripod. So you can start to like find out about who we're designing for by which family the products are going for. And then we can start to tailor to who would be interested in that product and start to look around and see what kind of products they're actually using and then what we need to be fitting. Makes sense. Okay. Makes sense for sure. Really interesting. I'm curious too. I got. I. I, I don't know if you've ever seen my videos, but I, I, for the Bellroy Venture Ready Sling 2.5 liter, I'm in love with this material. Now I know you use different materials based on different colors, and I'm curious, like, how does that work then? Like, do you? All right. So, this is this the buy to ripstop nylon? By the way, I, I always say that it is. Yeah. I hope that I'm right. All right. Well, my first question is. Where do you guys find this? Because I love this freaking material. It's, it's so awesome. I've never seen any other bags. I've never seen other bags use it. You know, there's so much overlap in the bag world um, in terms of fabrics. But um, that one, I just feel like what you guys hit a freaking home run on that one. Um, I mean, Bo, you, you share my sentiment in terms of yeah. that actual ripstop fabric, right? Yeah. I feel like JJ is now saying that he makes it himself. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, secret, totally. secret family so, recipe. Yeah, hand woven. Um, <laughs> I actually dye it all in the bathtub at home. Um, No, well, this is really a big question for Dav. And I think that it shows um, part of the reason why our our brand is kind of structured the way it is. And we've got two product directors. So, you know, that there is so much information that is held within understanding what the materials are that we are aspiring to using, the ones that we are using, what is coming in for that, that next range. Um, and then also being able to vet and search for those fabrics and actually get get the right fabrics that are going to perform on the uh, the durability 
on our sustainable objectives, on making sure that we're using the correct chemicals and we're not using anything that is, that is harmful at all. And within this, we actually have, um, you know, Davin, we have another uh, CMF lead, and then we, which is Colors, Materials, Finish. And then we also have uh, two developers that are focused on the, um, on the textile hunt. So it is not an individual, it is a team that actually helps us try and create and track down and, and find the best fabrics for us. But that makes total sense because, you know, I've been very blessed to have, you know, received so many Bellroy products to check out and to review and just the the selection of fabrics and the, the variation and the amount of colors that you guys offer and just how all those different work and not how like, it's not just like, hey, well, we offer this backpack in six different colors and all six colors are the exact same fabric. You'll offer, you could offer a bag in three or four or two to three different fabrics that I've seen, you know, in each of the different colors. So that process is so fascinating to me, but I think it gives Bellroy such a soul as to where you feel like every single color choice wasn't necessarily made, or the fabric choice with the color wasn't necessarily made for convenience, it was made for what was best for that particular color. And that's probably yeah. a logistical supply chain skew nightmare, but you yeah. guys pull it off, and like, um, yeah, it's, just, it's just really impressive, so you know, tip of the hat there. Yeah, thanks, it is not um, simple. And it's like, but you want the outcome to look like it was very natural and very easy. And I think that that separation of like color from the material is, is something that often you'll see like, uh, like if you have one product and it comes in like eight colors, you'll know which ones that the fabric can't quite hold that color. Like it's not actually mm -hmm. set up or designed to, to be able to be in a light color, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so being able to actually have that brand flexibility of going like, we're going to do a light color. We need to figure out what is actually going to be a material that can hold up and um, show in the world in a good way in that, that actual textile. Speaking of uh, textiles, fabrics and colors, um, I'm coming from, from the film industry world and the advertising world, right? And in many production companies, they have these director scouts who are specifically mm -hmm. there to kind of go out and look for the newest directors and stuff like that. So I'm wondering, do you have in your team like a color and textile researcher that is just specifically there to kind of look in the world for the next new fabric and the next new zipper and the next new color for the next season? Is, or is it just all of the team that is doing that or do you actually have a specific person to do that kind of research yeah that is a specialized role and this is really like where dad can talk heavily oh. to that as he's uh he's the cmf creative director so um that ends up being like really under his domain and he's mm -hmm. out there looking for what's coming and heading to trade shows and heading over to uh, to our suppliers, often in, uh, in Korea, who are weaving the textiles for us. So that's a, that's a question we'll have to save for uh, for when Dad comes back on. We can double click into that one a little bit more. But I'm really curious about that because the Bellroy textile game is just mm, chef's kiss. I got um I'm gonna take the conversation a little bit of a different way because I did get some questions from the Nomads Nation community that they wanted to yep. ask specifically with backpacks. So I'm just going to throw a couple your way and Bo, feel free to chase sure. up on any of these if you want. Mm -hmm. I got, I, I picked some of my favorites because we got like 50 questions so I can only pick a few. <laughs> okay, um, cool. The first one, the first one isn't, isn't a question. It's just a statement. They said, bring back the classic pouch plus please. So just that I'm doing, I'm doing them a favor. So it's, it's an official request. Classic pouch plus please bring it back. Got it? Noted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next Often one. Often when things go, it's very difficult to get them back. There will, there will be reasons. So. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. I mean, is, is it, would it just be, you know, they're, they're not selling so hot? Or could there be other factors that are playing into that? What, what would be a reason Bellroy might retire a product? Uh, there's definitely sales. Uh, we have to hit a certain threshold to try and make products work. Um, because there's a lot of maintenance to keep things up on the website and materials updated, etc. Um, and then sometimes it can be a construction update where we've learned how to do things in a better way or we've, we've experienced that product enough that we know the shortfallings of it. 
and we've come up with a new design and that new design makes the old one look very, very tired. And it's an mm. immediate thing that once you've done that, the old product is very hard to look at anymore. And that's when you send it into retirement. Uh, and on that note then, yeah. and I, you know, if, I, if I'm asking too much about company policies, just tell me to, to back off. But um, I'm curious, like, do you guys have like a target? Like, hey, every year we try and you know, retire 20% of products to make room for the better sellers, or is it just sort of depends on what's happening year by year? Uh, it's much more variable, and I won't really go into it. I think <laughs> I gotta ask the hard hitting questions, man. Um, all yeah, right, yeah. another question. Another question that I had um, was uh, I thought this was pretty interesting because you guys have this classy heritage sort of look, and I always use the word quirky as well with like Bell Works. It's like something just fun about it as well, where it has that soul. Um, but this person, uh, someone from the Nomads Nation community, asked, "Would you ever do products with waxed canvas?" I know that you know Dabs are our fabrics guy, but you know from your perspective on the, on the bag side, why have you not? It seems like a really easy thing to do for you guys, but you, as far as I'm aware, you've never done wax canvas, have you? Uh, we have issues with uh, heading down the cotton path. So from the actual amount of energy that gets invested in uh, harvesting cotton, the amount of water that gets used, and then the way that it gets shipped around and actually processed, um, we find that actually much more environmentally intensive than if we are to use a recycled polyester or a recycled nylon. Oh, so from so our point of view, we don't, um, we haven't found that that cotton canvas ends up getting um, a win for us. Even when it's waxed, you still have a lot of durability concerns that, that mean that we don't pass our abrasion tests that you, we can't actually incorporate into product and, and have it, you know, last for as long as we we wanted to. That's so interesting. <laughs> totally. totally. Gives, <laughs> but gives but when I minds dis- are blown right now, we're like, what? yeah, it gives this whole discussion a new, totally new perspective that I've never thought about because I, I feel that nowadays the perception of anything organic basically is this. It's more environmentally, or it's somewhat more environmentally friendly because it's it's a natural thing you don't have to make it you don't have to create new i I don't have a better word new plastics but now hearing it from your perspective that processing cotton and delivering cotton is has a much as as far as i if i understand correctly a much higher impact on the environment is it's very interesting. Because yeah, Gigi, I, I think said, you, use the, you use the term energy intensive, right? Yeah. Yeah, so like thinking of the way that a bag is used, so we know that plastics is an issue, but a lot of the times the issue with plastics is some of the chemicals that are used in processing um, also in end of life. And so within Balroy and within bags in particular, once you've actually made the product, you have very low amount of energy that's actually used throughout the product life. So if you consider your, your clothes, for instance, there's a lot of energy that goes in in actually washing and drying, like particularly if you're in North America and you use a tumble dryer all the time. Like, you know, there's a lot of energy and a lot of like um, off washing of microplastics that actually happens from your apparel. When you're within something like bags, once the energy that's used to actually make it and get it to you is done, it's really like hit the end of its um, like energy life cycle. At that stage, it's actually quite quite static and it's not creating more uh, issues or, or challenges for the environment. Um, at this this stage in time, it is difficult to to have a full bag and just go like, hey, I want to recycle that. But that is one of the goals that it's like, how do you end up getting to that next phase where you can have a product that you're able to just return. It can be recycled and then made into another another piece and really hit to that circular level. At the moment, our focus is really on making sure that, you know, once you choose a Bellroy product, that we didn't make a, a pocket that is specifically sized for a phone that no longer exists in five years. We didn't make choices from the, the visual aesthetic of it that are really trying to follow uh, trends or colors that are of the moment or that it has anything that is really, you know, like um, highly fashionable because those fashion trends are actually a lot faster than that we're comfortable in supporting. 
So we try to keep our, our minimalist design is actually a byproduct of our environmental goals of making sure that it's a product that is loved and used for as long as possible because the energy is in making it. Mm. And then the benefit that you get from it being, you know, comfortable and hard wearing and not going out of style and out of materials that, that pass those tests that make sure that the abrasion resistance is, is high enough performance ends up being where we can actually offer the best, uh, the best benefit and the best use of that energy. Interesting. Makes sense. <clears throat> my, uh, my next question for the nomadization community is, and I got a few different variations of this question, and uh, mm. this is coming from a, not a point of criticism, but just curious... This. Um, why don't you guys put more luggage pass-through holders on your backpacks? It seems like a lot of your bags don't really have this feature. And I can just tell you, as somebody who has um, responded to every single comment on my YouTube channel, the people want luggage pass-through holders, JJ. Yeah. They want them. Um, so so why, is it, why just, is that a conscious just design Just keep choice? watching the site. <laughs> we, we are definitely hearing that and moving toward it. Mm -hmm. um, it does take time to, to add these in and, and pull them across the range because we also don't uh, do a seasonal development. So our product life, once we actually finish designing it, uh, stays for a number of years. Like we're not a uh, fast fashion or a fashion brand that each year you, you churn and burn whatever you, you didn't sell and then you start afresh again. So unfortunately for us, the lag that we have with some of the luggage pass-throughs on backpacks is, is a bit of a long one, but it is something that we're addressing and, and product going forward is definitely pushing towards that uh, luggage pass-through as just being standard. Awesome. Yeah, uh, the nomadization community is going to be stoked to hear that. So thank you. Uh, the last question I had from the nomadization community is, uh, we just want a specific date for when the next Bellroy Cariology collab will be dropping. Um, can you just... <laughs> I know the date, but, you... <laughs> but it's not coming out with, uh, with you guys. Sorry. <laughs> Dang it. Again, I, fig I figured it was worth a shot. No harm in trying. Yep. Um, they, you guys got something under wraps, though, something we can get excited about? Yeah, there's something, there's something okay. cooking. So I'll, I'll yeah, take what it's, I can get. It's, it's within this year, this year being 2024. So we're good. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but looking on. at my notes, that was about all that I had on my end. But uh, any other questions you had question. on your end, Bob? Yeah, yeah I do. please. I do. Yeah. Uh, Bellroy has a really big portfolio of item categories, I would say, uh, besides just bags. From your perspective, I mean, you are a product designer, um, I would say by heart, probably. Is there any other categories that you personally would love to explore for Bellroy in the future? For instance, Bellroy, Bellroy phone, Bellroy headset, or I don't know, Bellroy shoes? <laughs> Luggage? Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely things that we are exploring actively, but I can't really comment too much on them. But I think uh, sure. that our wide uh, expanse of product. Like when you actually look from our, our smallest carry items to our largest carry items, you know, including doing, you know, we've done custom designed pens. We do watch straps, phone mm, cases, exactly. you know, backpacks, duffels, and, and everything in between. Um, I think that we've got a really unique team here that's actually found a way of like, of, analyzing product and finding ways of like adding and embedding value into them. So I really strongly believe that our team as it, set, as it stands can actually grow and really push into a bunch of different areas. And there's a lot of, um, of opportunity for us to, to reach out and kind of like broaden our own horizons of what, what the mm. brand Bellroy can actually encompass. Um, that being said, we struggle not to do uh, all of the ideas we have. So a lot of the time when we're talking about that, that genesis point and about like what is it that, that kicks a project off, there are the husks of many, many dead concepts and ideas and thoughts and discussions about all of these different areas where we feel that, that we have a, a product insight that we'd love to get into the world, but that isn't quite, you know, brand aligned or, or strength aligned with the with the team that doesn't actually, you know, fulfill our own objectives or, or fall in line with where I think we want our brand to actually grow and, and move toward. That's really interesting because like I just re I just read the Steve Jobs biography uh, autobi uh, auto the Steve Jobs biography recently and obviously he has such a passion for product development. Um, but he would always get his gather his team around the concept of like 
um, celebrating the things that they said no to even more mm. so than the things they said yes to because that gave them a relentless focus that allowed them to make the best iPhone possible, iPad, iPod possible, right, as opposed to just being spread too thin. Do you guys sort of have a similar sort of MO when it comes to you know, your focus? Like, are, or are you happy to take uh, bite, bite off a little more that you can chew sometimes? Uh, we bite off more than we can chew, and we chew <laughs> very hard. You, you chew um, hard. Yeah. I think that we have a few a few processes in place that allow us to cast the net really wide and then bring it into something that that makes a lot of um, a lot of sense for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the Steve Jobs one is like he would write up all the ideas on the blackboard or, or on the whiteboard, right? And then he would go around and he would cross them all out except for three, yeah, and it was like that. that was the focus. Um, we're definitely not as as ruthless, but we do have a um, we do have a tendency to to cull some very good prospects, uh, making sure that we can focus on the ones that, that you know we've really valued and we really have made a choice as a team that matters. But just I know you probably aren't allowed to say what you are designing at Bellroy, so therefore I would love to know from you personally: is there anything that you would personally would design in the future is there a product category that you would love to explore for yourself for myself yeah um i think i do love eyewear and i do uh really like you know watches in a a way of actually like applying uh different techniques to to like watch design and not anything to do with a smartwatch this is all all ways to make analog more awesome because I feel like when we know w- where your heart is at, we kind of know where you, where you will fight when you yeah. are sitting but, at the but, table. So, so, that, right so that's saying <laughs> what I, I can do outside of work. So my heart is bags. So I'm, like in the, I'm in the position where it's like I, I get to work, live, and breathe bags. And this is something that, you know, since... Uh, since moving to Vietnam way back in like 2004 or 2003, um, bags has really been my design passion and mm. spending all that time there. I was there for three years, like just living and breathing bags. And so when it comes to like, what is, what is my heart and what is the passion? It's like, it's bags and it's carry throughout. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah. that's really where um, I think that as a designer, I'm best able to add a lot of value um, and then I'm working with a team that is also, you know, incredibly talented and we've got a very disparate set of skills. So we don't have any, um, like what I call double ups. Each individual has like something that they're more tailored and better suited for. Mm. And we actually like pass the torch around and get feedback from each of us in those different areas when, so cool. when the project requires it. So cool. So it's like, I guess that sums up like I'm living my best design life or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I'd say so. I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> but just from the two product categories that you just mentioned, I would love to see a Bellroy watch. And now that I wear uh, glasses, I would love to see Bellroy glasses in the future. Maybe. And since you're taking requests, uh, yeah. I'll take a Bellroy headphones case, please. And um, yeah. a 45 liter Bellroy travel bag. Are you writing this down, JJ? I feel like you should be. Oh. <laughs> Laser sharp memory. Uh, yeah, I got a lot <laughs> yeah. Any other uh, questions you got, Bo? Um, I do, but I think they are more t- targeted uh, towards the wallet side. So. Hey, That's we'll, we'll save it for part two. Yeah. It's a good excuse, right? Definitely. Awesome. Well, on that note, I think we can go ahead and cut this, uh, make this a wrap. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. JJ, this has been like mind-blowingly awesome. Like The community was so stoked about it. They asked all these questions. Um, I think that this could hopefully be the beginning of you know maybe a few more of these. We'll get Davin back on here. But I just really appreciate your time um, being transparent about the Bellroy process. And we're looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys got. You said the Cariology Bellroy collab will be June what day? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, yeah. uh, I'll get oh, you. That, sorry, sorry, the the line cut out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> JJ left the chat. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. JJ, thank you so much for uh, yeah. coming on today. Thanks, guys. Bo, great, thank great you. To as catch always, up with you. thank you so much. And uh, this is the Nomadization Podcast. We'll catch you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.